Thanks for joining everyone. My name's Poppy and I'm currently completing my Master's in Geography at Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today I'll be presenting to you some of my results for my Master's thesis titled Drivers of Biodiversity and the Megabenthic Communities of the Chartagus Fracture Zone. I'll be focusing on the environmental drivers of the biodiversity in this presentation. Located in the North Atlantic, the Chartagus Fracture Zone is nestled halfway between Ireland's continental shelf and the Grand Banks of Newfoundland and Canada. As of 2012, the Chartagus Fracture Zone was split into two marine protected areas, the South and the North. The Southern NPA is fully protected from anthropogenic activities, which includes the water column, the seafloor and the subsoil. The Northern NPA only covers the water column due to an outstanding submission from Iceland to extend the boundary of their economic exclusion zone. This leaves the benthic communities vulnerable to harmful anthropogenic activities. In 2022, this could include commercial fisheries, as the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission will be reviewing the fisheries closure that has been instated in this region since 2009. The Chartagus Fracture Zone is a transverse fault, which offsets the Mid-Atlantic Ridge by over 340 kilometers. It is the most important latitudinal biogeographic boundary on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and is influenced by several oceanic currents. The North Atlantic Current is a major influence from the west, crossing the fracture zone as it moves to the east. On the north side of the Chartagus Fracture Zone, the subpolar front creates especially rich surface waters in this region, which are known to support charismatic megafauna such as cetaceans and seabirds, and could create highly biodiverse benthic communities as a result. As an oceanic core complex, the Chartagus Fracture Zone is characterized by mid-ocean ridge igneous and metamorphic rocks, providing the hard substratum needed for attachment by sessile species, including reforming skeletarian corals, octocorals, demosponges, glass sponges, and, cr and stalk crinoids. This core complex becomes ecologically important in the region of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge as it comprises large bathial habitat surrounded either side by abyssal plains and the presence of hard substratum, which can contribute to habitat heterogeneity and likely lead to heightened biodiversity. Despite the considerable amount of research that has been con conducted in the North Atlantic, from the Irish continental slope around the Azores and even certain areas of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there remain significant gaps in the knowledge of some of the more remote regions. This project aims to help fill some of these gaps in the knowledge and contribute to the coherence of the ecological records for this area by asking the question, what environmental factors are driving the biodiversity on the Chartagus Fracture Zone? To do this, we utilised HD video footage collected by the ROV Holland 1 on the Tosca survey in May 2018 aboard the Celtic Explorer. Before annotating, a species catalogue was created from still images collected during the five dives and used as a reference for species identification. Organisms larger than two centimetres were identified and assigned to a morpho species. Subject types were recorded using the EUNIS classification system for deep sea seabed categories. We created a species matrix in R from the rural species observations. These were grouped into 50 meter sections for analysis, along with average values for temperature, salinity, salinity, depth and slope. Dominant substrate type. The dominant substrate type for each section was determined by measuring the length of cover for each section. These were all georeferenced using the USBL data from the ROV. Diversity estimates, including the Shannon Wiener H index and species richness were, ca were calculated and species accumulation curves were derived using the vegan package in the R program. Species observations were also binned into 250 meter depth bands for analysis using, using species accumulation curves. A total of 67.5 hours of ROV video was annotated, covering 34 kilometers of seafloor and just shy of 160,000 individual organisms were observed, which made up 333 megafaunal morpho species. This is likely an underestimate due to the presence of cryptic species and difficulty identifying fauna down to species level from the video alone. The species accumulation curve displaying the morphous species occurrence by dive tells us that dive nine is slightly more diverse than the other dives. 
This could be due to Dive9 having a higher ratio of bedrock cover, over 87%, compared to the other ROV dives. Here's an example of the higher levels of biodiversity found on Dive9. This is also supported by the species accumulation curve for substrate type, where bedrock is shown to have the highest morpho species occurrence. From Dive 6, this was apparent when boulders were populated by multiple coral and sponge species in comparison to sandy areas, which only appeared to host xenophyophores. When examining the morpho species occurrence for each death band, the greatest number of morpho species were found in two of the bands between 1,750 and 2,249 metres. The orange death band between 1,500 and 1,749 metres probably would have exhibited a similar result to the pink band had it been sampled more. So here, whenever I mention something to be significant, this implies that the p-value was less than 0 0.0001. Results from the GAM suggest that depth and slope had significant effects on the Shannon index, which increased with depth down to a maximum at around 1,200 metres followed by a decline until 2,200 metres. The Shannon index increased steadily with increasing slope and then levelled off at a slope value of about 30 degrees. The p-values from the GAM for the bedrock, gravel and sands move terms showed these had a significant effect on the Shannon index. Depth and slope also had significant effect on the species richness, which exhibited a continuous decline with depth below approximately 1,100 metres, but showed a steady increase as slope values increased. P values for the bedrock, gravel and sand smooth terms for species riches were significant. Dive 7 show, shows us a nice example of the effect slope had on species riches and diversity. Here is a steep vertical wall populated by corals and sponges compared to a flat sand and gravel plain with little, little really going on here. When examining the effect of depth on abundance by phyla, or all phyla shared a relatively similar trend where, the, where they only slightly decreased as depth increased, except for foraminifera, which includes the xenophyophores, that exhibit, exhibit a sharp decline at about 2,250 metres. They demonstrate distinct preferences for depth and slope in comparison to the remaining phyla as they decrease more rapidly at depths below 2,250 metres and beyond slopes of 20 degrees. Boulders, gravel and sand were significant substrate types with respect for taxon abundance. 122 coral morpho species were observed in total from the five ROV dives at depths between 560 and 2,890 metres. The species accumulation curve for corals for each depth band shows the greatest number of morpho species were found in two of the bands between 1,500 and 2,000 metres. There was notably higher numbers of numbers of coral morpho species on bedrock. This plot shows the density of corals on dive eight, which spans the Hecate cement and had the highest density of, densities of corals out of all five dives. Density values refer to the number of corals per meter squared, and each circle represents a 50 meter section of the transect. The areas where there are no circles on the transect line represent areas where visibility or video quality was too poor to annotate with any accuracy. We can see that there are high densities of, densities of corals towards the peak of the cement. Sponges made up a total of 39% of the individual organisms observed, with over 60,000 sponges recorded belonging to 77 morpho species. The species accumulation curves for sponge occurrence show that the greatest number of morpho species were observed on bedrock, closely followed by biogenic gravels and boulders. Sand and gravel had considerably lower numbers of morpho species, Sponges were most abundant within two deck bands between 1,750 and 2,250 metres. Dive 9 had the highest sponge densities, and the plot here shows this in a, a bit more detail. Dive 9 followed a ridge feature, as can be seen from the bathymetry map, and so the depth didn't change much over the transect. There was a relatively high density of sponges throughout the ridge, but especially towards the end of the dive where densities are as high as 6 metres uh, six sponges per meter squared. So a quick recap on the results as there was a lot going on there. Based on the video analysis of five, tra five transects at the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone, higher levels of morpho species biodiversity tended to occur at depths between 1,500 and 2,249 meters and in areas characterized by bedrock and steeper slopes. 
Carl showed the highest species richness, while sponges showed the highest number of individuals present. A total of three vulnerable marine ecosystem types were encountered, including coral gardens, sponge aggregations, and xenophyophore fields. So what do these ecological descriptions mean for the future protection status of the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone? This study provides a detailed insight into the megafaunal biodiversity, its spatial variation, and their potential environmental drivers within the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone North MPA. We hope this study will help direct ecologically driven sampling efforts on this fracture zone in the future for a better understanding of the rare and vulnerable species that are present. The confirmed presence of dense sponge aggregations, coral gardens and xenophyophore fore fields are important observations as, they, as the protection status of this region will come into debate in the coming years. In conjunction with this study, all morpho species observations were submitted to the IC's 2021 VME a data call to be added to a database on the deep sea ecosystems of the North Atlantic. We suggest these species data and biodiversity descriptions should be used in the future decision making when reviewing the protection status of this remote region of the North Atlantic. We would like to thank the taxonomic experts who were contacted for help in identifying various megafaunal groups. We would also like to thank the deck and scientific crew of the Tosca survey aboard the Celtic Explorer who worked tirelessly to collect the RV video used in this study. Thanks to the Deep Sea Biology Symposium Organising Committee for facilitating this presentation and I hope that they take the opportunity to ensure that the next symposium is made more accessible to the wider Deep Sea community and I'm happy to take any questions.